that. So good afternoon, everybody. I am uh, Karuna Krishna Malesh, uh, the director and director of membership and market development from the Open Group. I am delighted to welcome you all for this webinar on the TOGAF standard 10th edition and the certification portfolio. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Andrew Oze. He is the fellow and vice president for standards and certification at the Open Group. I would uh, take a brief moment here to thank our member organization, Nozam Tech, who actually has helped us in assisting and you know, planning the session for the Middle East. So thank you on that, Shehab and the team. Right? Uh, I hope that you will enjoy this webinar uh, and I hope you'll find it informative as well. Uh, as um, um, Shehab has mentioned, we will be having a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Uh, please wait till until the session to ask your questions, right? Um, so uh, today what we're going to be doing is essentially uh, looking at three aspects of the TOGAF standard 10th edition. We will look at one of the prominent features of the standard itself and how the updated certification portfolio for individuals who have previously studied the version 9.2 and the one who are planning to take the 10th edition will affect. That's something that we're going to be looking at. We'll also be dwelling into some of the new learning parts that have been designed specifically for the 10th edition. Now, due to the limited time that we have, about 40, 50 minutes or that we have, our discussion on the TOGAF standard 10th is going to be concise and highlighting only the most prominent features of the standard. Right. The open group enterprise architecture framework, you know, most of you, as you know, is famously known as the TOGAF, uh, is one of the widely adapted enterprise architecture framework that provides a comprehensive approach for designing, planning, implementing, and governing enterprise information technology architecture. It is also widely adopted across industry and has become one of the de facto standards in the area of enterprise architecture. We have seen this being adopted majorly by governments globally and also by non-government and public sector units as well. Uh, as some of you would know, that standard offers a very structured method for the organization to develop and manage their enterprise architecture. And it also ensures that you know, it aligns between the business strategies IT infrastructures and the technology solution. Uh, TOCAF has been designed to be flexible and adaptive, you know, allowing organization to tailor its usage to its specific needs and context, right? Um, all the standards from the open group are vendor neutral, so is the TOGAF. So TOGAF is a vendor neutral and supports integration of various architecture frameworks, methodologies, and tools. Uh, the TOGAF standard has been developed and maintained by the open group since 1995 and the TOGAF standard 10th edition was launched last year April uh, along with the new certification portfolio. Uh, so that was the brief about TOGAF. Now I would want to talk about a little bit about what is TOGAF standard 10th edition, what has changed since its previous version, what it means uh, to somebody who's wanting to adopt or even look at doing the certification for the TOGAF standard 10th edition. While the TOGAF 10th standard 10th edition was being launched, we did receive a lot of feedback from the practitioner from the industry. And one of the asks was that they wanted more improved guidance and more topical guidance as such. So as a result, one of the key features in this edition is a very updated modular structure that enables further extension of the content itself. Right? Uh, there is now a significant emphasis on providing better guidance, which I'll be showing in the upcoming slides. So the TOGAF standard 10th, as I said, released in 2022, has a number of new features and enhancements. Uh, it has a strong focus on agile environments and digital transformation, uh, extended guidance documents to help organizations implement the framework and customize it to their own needs. Um, and there's also the new learning paths and the TOGAF certification portfolio, right? Um, so let's look at the modular structure of the TOGAF standard 10th edition here, right? Uh, so if you go to the Open Group website and navigate to the website itself, you will find a link on the Open Group library, which is the, the top right corner. So once inside the library, you will see uh, top five boxes displayed in the slide, as you see here. Uh, the first box is the TOGAF library, which contains all the enterprise architecture related content, including the standard itself. So the standard is situated in the TOGAF library, which is again a component of the open group library. Now within the library, we have the standard and also a lot of supplementary materials such as white papers, guides, reference cards, and so on. A lot of material for you to look at and learn about the standard, right? Uh, now, uh, the standard has now transformed from being a single document as some 
some of you would be aware the previous version was more of a single uh, dense document of the version 9.2. It has now become a very collection of document categorized into two major sections as shown in the slide. Right, The first category is known as the TOGAF fundamental content, uh, which is the more stable, long lasting, uh, predominantly corresponding to what's present in the uh, TOGAF 9.2 version. However, this one has evolved and has been more modularized. The second category is what we refer as the dynamic content in the form of TOGAP series guide. So what you see in the fundamental content is pretty much the what of the standard and the TOGAP series guide are intended to how to. Thus, there is a, a lot of new material, new guidance that we have added uh, as part of the TOGAP standard 10th edition. Uh, we have broken each of the document into these little circles to emphasize the modular structure. So on the left, uh, what you see is the six TOGAF fundamental content documents. And then we have introduced 20 different, I would say about 22, because recently we added two more series guides. So 22 TOGAF series guides uh, at the moment. And we expect uh, these series guides to grow over time. Uh, now today we have about 28 documents as part of the TOGAF uh, standard 10th edition, which is six corresponding to the fundamental content and 22 corresponding to the TOGAF series guide. Uh, but there is going to be a few more edition added pretty soon. Um, the open groups enterprise architecture forum that develops and maintains the TOGAF standard is currently working on adding more content and more additional TOGAF series guide. So you, as I mentioned, you can expect this content to have additional documents and extended information as well. Uh, one of the key things uh, Open Group has done over decades is to ensure as we have progressed and had more editions of the standard to maintain continuity. And that's been the crucial uh, part that we have maintained through the decades. Uh, the TOGAF standard 10th edition as well upheld the core characteristics of the standard throughout the TOGAF fundamental content. So when examining the TOGAF uh, fundamental content, you will observe similar elements from the previous version. Some of you are aware of the standard will be able to recognize some of the diagrams which are common to the previous editions as well. So such as, you know, the uh, the architecture development method cycle, the catalog, uh, the diagrams, the matrices, models for enterprise segment and you know, capability and so on. So you will see a continuity. Uh, you will be able to relate to what's there in the TOGAF standard 10 because there is some continuity from the previous editions as well. Right. Uh, so and that's on the TOGAF fundamental content, right? Uh, I wanted to basically tell you what 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 you see in TOGAF fundamental content, right? Uh, now, uh, what you have is that you know it is it is pretty much the stable content from the version 9.2. So, but we have revised and reorganized it, right? Uh, we have split into a collection of interconnected documents, uh, making it more adoptive for future chains. Now, this modularity will enable us to alter individual parts of the standard as necessary. So it will further support the evolution of the fundamental content itself. And also you will see that in the diagram, uh, the TOGAF fundamental content is located in the TOGAF library, which is again supported by series of TOGAF uh, series guides. Right? Uh, TOGAF series guides you know, provides, as I mentioned, the how-to of the standard. So it covers various topics. Uh, it covers topics from general how-to to the guidance on establishing an enterprise architecture team and also some domain-specific material, uh, which I'll cover in the next couple of slides. Right? Uh, so in the general how-to guidance, there is how-to guidance for the practitioner. Uh, there is guidance on TOGAF standard in the digital enterprise as well. We also do have some domain-specific uh, series guides. We are particularly strong in the business architecture. Uh, we have about six different business architecture series guides. So there's a lot of extended content that's come along, right? Uh, there is also uh, uh, extended content on data information architecture. There is also information on agile methods and TOGAF ADM and agility and so on, right? There is, uh, in addition to that, there is also a lot of reference models and methods. There is a particular TOGAF series guide dedicated to how to establish and evolve in an EA team, which some of you would find it useful in your respective teams and organizations. So there is specific documents where you can go and check the information. Right? There's also TOGAF leaders guide to establish and evolve an EA capability as well. So even that you will find as part of the TOGAF series guide. Um, so that's that's was that's about the TOGAF standard 10th edition. Uh, now you may ask, how do we get started? How do we get this information? It's pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, well, what we have done is we have come up with uh, 
uh, a white paper, I would say, uh, which serves an excellent introduction to the standard itself. You know, even if you're new to the standard, the resource will provide you with an understanding and how this has been structured, right? And for those who are familiar with the previous edition, uh, the white paper includes release notes detailing the changes made. So it's an excellent resource if you're wanting to understand the standard without really diving into the standard document itself. And I've been told that the standard is about 1900 odd pages, including the new uh, series guides that's been added. Uh, this white paper is about 44 odd pages, uh, and it also provides a recommendation on how to start using the standard. So it is quite useful in that sense. Right? You will be able to get this information on the open group website itself. Uh, what we have done is, as part of uh, those, the standard, we have uh, compiled uh, various versions or various formats, if you will, uh, of the standard, right? You can access uh, the standards, uh, as I mentioned, as part of the Open Group website. Uh, there is an online digital edition, which is absolutely new, which wasn't there for the previous edition. So you have an online digital edition, which has a graphical representation. If you see on the left side of the slide, which is here, this is the graphical representation. So if you click on it, it takes you the textual uh, uh, form of the standard. There is a PDF version of the standard itself. And of course, there's a hard copy. In a hard copy, you can buy it from any of the authorized sellers from the market. Right. Uh, so these are the three ways you can you know, get the information in addition to the white paper that I'd mentioned. Right. Um, I, I just thought probably it'd be good for you to just know what's there in digital edition. Right. It's just not plain standard information, but there's a lot more in there that's happening. Right. Uh, so uh, the digital edition um, is actually designed to help you navigate to you know, specific sections quite easily. That is the intent when it was made, right? So it provides some assistance with navigation. So we have provided both graphical entry and a textual entry. So if you click any of this, as you see, it takes you the textual aspect of the standard. And this is how the textual uh, standard looks like, right? So um, uh, there's a search capability here. You can go through any sec particular section if you would like. And if you also have a navigation bar, you can scroll through. You can go to specific, specific section as well as part of the digital edition. That's one thing that uh, that's been there for the standard 10th edition. Um, the other new thing that's there, which wasn't there available, is uh, we have added one helpful feature, uh, which enables you to provide feedback of any page. Right. So you will notice a bug on the i uh, on the on every page on the left side, in the top left corner. You'll see a bug icon. So when you click on it, it will uh, a form will appear, uh, which is allowing you to give feedback on each page. Um, so far, we have received uh, you know, quite a few feedback and it's been quite valuable as well. Now, whatever feedback is given, it goes directly to the, the team that is developing the standard and, and also they track the bugs. So you know, they make sure that whatever is coming in, they are they're addressing each of those uh, feedback given by uh, the community, I would say. Right? Um, so that's one new feature as part of the uh, uh, digital edition that you will find. Um, so that, that's about the entire TOGA standard 10th edition, how to get started, how to access information. Uh, we will be providing additional links as well as part of the proceedings, which will be useful post the session for you to go and read about the standard, right? Uh, now, what we will do next is we will look at the certification portfolio. Now, certification portfolio is all the training, the learning and the learning parts that have been built around the standard 10th edition. Uh, so if you want to become an enterprise architect or want to become a business architect or take a certain specialities, right? These are the learning parts that you'll be looking at. So uh, we will give you information on what is the prerequisite, what's required, what's time required for it uh, about uh, the new certifications. Um, I would like to invite my colleague Andrew Jose to dwell deep into this. Andrew, over to you. you. Can hear me? Yes, we can, and we can ah, see you. Hopefully, you can see the slides as well. So, thanks very much for that, Karuna. Uh, I'd like to talk now a little bit about the uh, the TOGAF certification portfolio. I'll be talking about what it is, what we mean by the TOGAF certification portfolio, and then also just looking at the learning path. Now, this is quite a a brief talk I'll be giving here. There's obviously a lot more detail we could go into, and obviously we're happy to take uh, questions in the Q&A. So we'll have plenty of time at the end to go through any detailed questions if we haven't covered them. So let's just uh, find my mouse and just click us forward. So what do we mean by the TOGAF certification portfolio? First of all, what, what we mean here is actually our certifications that cover both the TOGAF standard version 9.2 as well as the TOGAF standard 10th edition. 
a question that often comes up is like, oh, well, now the TOGO standard 10th edition's out, does that mean that we're going to stop supporting the 9.2 standard and we're going to stop supporting uh, certification around TOGAF 9 certification? And the answer to that is no. We'll actually continue supporting um, TOGAF 9 certification for as long as there is market demand. We've got a lot of uh, users out there right now who are using the, the version 9 standard. Uh, and, and you know, requiring TOGAF 9 certification. So we'll continue to support that. Um, question often comes up, well, you know, should I do 9 or should I go for one of the new 10th edition? And I'll explain. We do have some learning paths that if you do decide to um, to do your, or you've got, you know, you decide to take TOGAF 9 certification because maybe there's a job requirement that needs that right now, how you can move forward to another couple of um, a couple of um, certifications and um, qualifications that we've developed, as well as I'll talk about um, the new paths uh, specifically for the 10th edition. So um, one thing you will have noticed when, when Karuna was explaining what the TOGAF standard 10th edition is now is it's expanded. It's basically expanded from one book. You know, there was one book that was about 600 pages to now it's actually uh, currently 28 documents. And I think the number, as Karuna said, is sort of approaching sort of somewhere between 1700 and 1900. I haven't, haven't counted them recently. Now, obviously, if we decided to do a single certification for all of that wide number of, you know, that, 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 that large number of documents, it would be a very shallow certification. So what we've done instead is to take a look at the standard, to take a look at that set of documents, and then to identify specific skill sets and competencies from within the documents. And we call these bodies of knowledge. So we've actually defined, so if we look in there, what we call a body of knowledge for the business architects. So if you look at this diagram, starting on the left, we've done one for business architects. So that's our business architecture body of knowledge. We've done one for enterprise architects, you know, our enterprise architecture body of knowledge. And we've also done a couple that we call the specialisms. So there are some new sort of documents, documentation in the standard, uh, specifically around agile and digital. We've also got one called for, for the leader. So as Karuna mentioned, we've now got a TOGAF leader's guide that's specifically dedicated to you know, setting up your practice. And so we've actually got a certification on that. And then the, the purple one on the right there, that's to show that we, we've got potential to add future and bodies of knowledge and future certification. So we've gone from a single standard, which is very large, to defining multiple bodies of knowledge covering various skill sets and competencies. And that then allows us to, to introduce multiple certifications. And um, I'll uh, show those in the next couple of slides. Here's a quick sort of overview, sort of an overview from um, it's almost looking down onto the sort of the portfolio. We'll also show the PATH version of the portfolio in a minute. And this just shows you what we've got here. Then the white boxes, those are the ones that are applicable to the TOGAF standard version 9.2. The sort of uh, greeny, um, turquoisey ones, those are the new ones for the TOGAF standard 10th edition. We've got a gray one also that applies to both. The integrating risk and security is something that applies to both. Um, now, some of these are at different sizes. So some of them are what we call certifications. Uh, we don't and I'll explain what that is in a minute. They're basically multi-day things and other things are a little bit smaller chunks of learning. The ones actually in italics are, are designed as smaller, uh, smaller courses, so you can take those much easier rather than having to go off site and attend. You can often self-study for those. And those are something that we call certification credentials. That's sort of, you know, the open group speak for specific, specific types of certifications. So if you hear somebody say, oh, well, that's a certification, that's typically, you know, two, three, four days of, of learning to get your sort of, you know, to, to, to get your certification. Whereas something that we call a certification credential can be as little as three hours and up. So they're typically three hours to, you know, maybe a, maybe a single day, depending on, on what the topic is. So let's look at the learning paths. As I mentioned, we just looked down sort of onto the portfolio from above. Now, if we look at the learning paths, first of all, just starting, you know, with where we are currently with the TOGAF standard version 9.2, so with the TOGAF 9 certification program, if you come down from the top here, so you're studying the standard, there are two, you know, there are basically two paths that you can go. You can go to the left and do your, um, your development, do your studying, your learning, 
in a stepwise manner. So you could take um, basically study for foundation. So you take the part one exam, you get your foundation qualification, and then you do further studies to take the part two exam to get fully qualified as what we call TOGAF 9 certified. Now, not everybody wants to do that. Some people think, well, you know, I'd rather just take a single exam. And I would just say that's a very long exam. So the TOGAF 9, the other path here going right is to take what we call a combined exam. So you see there's a combined part one and part two exam. So if you want to sit down and take them both at the same time, you can go straight to TOGAF 9 certified. Now we'll just say if you do take that path and you fail one of the parts, then you have to go and get the other part before you can get to TOGAF 9 certified. So um, it's, you know, there's not a sort of half measure if you go that way. Now, if we look what we've introduced for the TOGAF standard 10th edition, so looking now on the right, if we start coming down, first of all, we'll come down the left part of the of the TOGAF standard 10th edition, you'll see the pattern is very similar to what we've got for TOGAF 9 certification. So coming in on, uh, on the enterprise architect track, so we want to you know, get, become an enterprise architecture practitioner, that's our aim there. We have a choice, we could again do it stepwise, again the two parts, take the part one exam, get the foundation, part two, get the practitioner, or again come down and do the combined. Now you'll notice along the bottom here, is a link between TOGAF 9 certification, being TOGAF 9 certified, going along there to becoming an enterprise architecture practitioner. And that's called the bridge. So we have a bridging path. Um, what this means is basically there is a path, if you've already got your TOGAF 9 certification, um, to get across, to update, to refresh, you know, to reskill, to update your skills to be for the new um, TOGAF um, Enterprise Architecture Practitioner from the 10th edition. Now that recognizes the effort you put in in the past. So it's actually, um, rather than uh, the two parts, the two, two part exams or the combined, there is actually a single bridge exam, which is actually a little bit smaller. So if you're coming in from the top anew, you will have to take a 60 minute part one followed by a 90 minute part two. But if you're coming across from TOGAF 9 to the, um, to the 10th edition, certification program, it's just a 60 minute exam, it's a single 60 minute exam. So we do give recognition for all the past learning, you know, for, for your skills and your competencies you've already achieved for your TOGAF 9 certification, that, that was a key thing. Now the other thing we've got on TOGAF 9 certification is a business architecture track. At the moment, this is just at the foundation level, but I would say this is a very practical course and we don't actually have enough to um to sort of go beyond foundation right now but if you remember we've got uh, six i think it might now be seven TOGAF series guys dedicated to business architecture a lot of techniques so it's you know value streams business capabilities organization mapping information mapping business scenarios there's a lot that you can come away with and start to apply after getting your business architecture foundation now the other thing we've done is I mentioned and you saw on that chart, we've got these, these things called specialisms. So um, these are actually the smaller chunks of learning I mentioned. If you look at these, in fact, you can tell the type of the certification, the type of the amount of the learning by the shape of the badge. So if you look at the TOGAF 9 Foundation, the Enterprise Architecture Foundation, they're sort of certificate shape badges in white. The other ones are blue, sort of teardrop shaped, and that shows that they're a smaller chunk of learning. So what we've done here is to introduce some new new courses, new qualifications that match particular TOGAF series guides. So we've got the Agile Specialist on the left. Um, that's because we've now got two TOGAF series guides around agility. That was obviously one of the key sort of um, bits of feedback we received on the version 9 standard as well. You know, how can I use the TOGAF standard in, in you know, agile environments? How can I do EA with agility? And so we've addressed that in a number of TOGAF series guides. Now you can take that either coming down either path so if you're TOGAF 9 certified if you've got TOGAF foundation and up basically you can take any one of these new special you know uh, certification credentials specialism so if you're TOGAF 9 foundation you can come there or even if you've got TOGAF EA foundation so we wanted to you know give some learning paths for people who were you know TOGAF 9 certified but might want to you know refresh their knowledge take on some of the new learn but not quite ready perhaps to to bridge across so, so we've got that there. Um, moving along to the right, we've got one called Digital Specialists. Again, there are a couple of um, TOGAF series guides addressing specifically how to use the TOGAF standard in a digital enterprise. 
also how to get yourself um, what they call digi digitally re digital readiness. There's actually an assessment technique that you can figure out, you know, are we ready to make that digital transformation? And there's a technique that you can you can follow in one of the new TOGAF series guides. And on the very far right there, we have uh, the leader. So again, we mentioned there was a, a specific TOGAF series guide and we actually have a, um, a, a, a set of materials that you can get that will lead to the credential. Now on these bottom ones here, I mentioned there are different sort of ways of learning, different chunks, different size chunks of learning. These are actually all available available for self-study right now. So you can go take them at your own leisure. Uh, there's an online assessment built in with the self-study. You can take those so that you know you don't have to go and attend a, a multi-day training course to take these um, certification credentials. Let's just see if I can move the slides along. Oh, and that's uh, really what I wanted to cover today. So it was really, really was just a, a quick sort of a very quick overview of what we mean by the certification portfolio and um, and the, the new uh, learning paths that are available. So we'll be handing back now, I think. Uh, uh, Andrew, I was yeah. thinking since we have time, maybe we can uh, just talk about a little bit detail of what it means to be uh, who, who needs to take a business architecture foundation or enterprise architecture foundation certification, right? Maybe since we have time. Okay. Um, so what's the audience? So the audience really for so foundation, if you imagine, if we first of all the enterprise architecture foundation, that's really for sort of anybody who needs, you know, to pick up the, you know, the common language, who needs to pick up that sort of basic understanding. So if you looked at um if you look at it, it's very much an introduction. If you looked at the syllabus and it's an introduction to the ADM, it's an introduction to the to the methods. It's basically, you know, just introducing the, the concepts um, very much designed for, you know, obviously a first introduction to enterprise architecture, uh, uh, an introduction for people who are working you know, with enterprise architects. So it's not just for enterprise architects. It may be for people who are working with them. So if you're working in an organization, perhaps you're not in the enterprise architecture sort of practice itself, but you're in another area that works with your enterprise architects. It's often very useful just to, you know, to understand and talk the same language. Obviously, if you want to become, um, you know, an enterprise architecture practitioner, it's part of the steps to doing that. So you can take that first if you just decide you want to before you move on to the practitioner. The practitioner is obviously taking things um, sort of upper level. So um, foundation is about, you know, um, uh, uh, understanding. And um, whereas, um, whereas the practitioner is really about analysis and things. Um, obviously, you can look at the different syllabuses. Uh, in fact, we're showing um, what, what's happening here. So yeah, so yeah. So if we talk about the enterprise architecture practitioner, that takes it up a level to a, to an a, to a, to being able to analyze and apply the standard. So that's very much a practical. You know, we've we've made sure that with the practitioner that we do include a lot of practical elements to that. There are actually practical exercises you can take as part of that course. Uh, to, yeah. So yeah, uh, we mentioned the bridge. So this is really for you know your TOGAF nine certified. You want to, um, you know, basically continue your professional development, update your qualifications. That is that path that you can go across. As I mentioned, there is recognition for, for past sort of efforts for your past studies. That um, that means that you know it is actually a smaller exam that you need to take. Obviously, the syllabus itself is very similar. We have something called an applied practitioner badge. This was something we didn't cover in the original things, but if you do take the enterprise architecture practitioner level, and you take that with one of the open groups accredited trainers, you have the opportunity to actually take some practical exercises, which if you complete those as part of the course, then you can get a, an additional badge. Now, the, they are based on a case study, so it's really an interactive case study. It's not an exam as such, it's just something that you would do in a group as part of an accredited training course and the accredited training course providers actually submit the names of their their students who completed this satisfactorily and then we issue them a supplementary badge so this is something you can get on top of your certification badge so this is business architecture one thing we didn't mention with business architecture if you look at this one this actually shows you the path that you can get to to become a business architecture foundation we actually we have an existing certification credential 
based on the version 9.2 standard. So there is a migration, sort of an update path that if you've got that uh, qualification, so if you've done what we call TOGAF Business Architecture Level 1, which was based on the 9.2 standard, there is basically a Delta course that you can take. It's a self-study course and, a, and an assessment that you'll be able to take that you can get to Business Architecture Foundation. That just includes basically four additional modules, which you wouldn't have covered in the 9.2 course. Um, otherwise, if you're coming at it afresh, then, then obviously you go along the bottom there, do the full course, the full set of modules, and then you would end you know, leading to Business Architecture Foundation. Uh, yeah, I will just talk quickly just about the specialisms. So as I mentioned, uh, we have a digital specialist. So that's very much focused on using TOGAF in the digital enterprise. And as I mentioned before, uh, there is what we call a readiness assessment technique. You can say, you know, is my is my organization ready for the, you know, to take to, to do that digital transformation? Prerequisite here, as I said, was TOGAF foundation or above. So these are learning paths. They're not, you know, the idea is you should have some fundamental knowledge of the TOGAF standard before you want to take on these specialisms. Benefits, yeah, that's the benefits. And the Agile specialist is very similar to the digital specialist. And, oops. Yeah, sorry, I was just going yeah. to the uh, specialist, yeah. Yeah, so again, as I mentioned, this is about using um, uh, Agile sort of techniques. Uh, so it's, but it's it, you know, as well as using how, how to adapt TOGAF to support, uh, you know, enterprises that are doing Agile development. It also shows, you know, one of our documents shows you how you can actually uh, apply the TOGAF ADM using Agile Sprints. So we've, you know, it goes down to that that level of detail in some of our documents. The Open Groups Architecture Forum, you know, based on its, you know, on its practitioners that have been sort of trying these things out in practice, have been have written down, you know, in, in the TOGAF series guides, their experience for others to draw on. And, uh, and as with digital specialists, the Agile specialists, again, there is a prerequisite. So with these specialisms, with these certification credentials, there are prerequisite you know, sort of qualifications you need before you can take them. So those are some of the benefits. And then that lastly, the leader, as we mentioned. So that's um, that's about, you know, setting up your practice. Now, not everybody needs to know how to set up a practice, which is one of the reasons why we've actually put this out into a separate certification credential. Originally, with TOGAF 9 certification, if you look at it, we touch a little bit on setting up the practice, but not that much. Now there is a dedicated TOGAF series guide. So there's a particular, you know, I think it's 130 pages, 13 chapters, you know, just, just looking at, you know, what it means to be a leader, all the things that you need to do, you know, and consider when you establish a practice, you know, setting up your governance, you know, what are the roles, what, how do you structure your organization, that type of thing. It's all, you know, in detail in that. And we've got a, a particular, um, certification credential. Again, as I mentioned, with the other certification credentials, right now you can go out, you can self-study these, you can go uh, online to the Open Groups Learning Management System, you can take um, a specialism. They're typically, I think they're about eight or nine modules. So we, you know, we expect those to take, you know, at least a sort of a day of dedicated effort. And then there is a, a, a built-in assessment that you can take. So you can take the assessment. Obviously, if you don't pass the assessment first time, you get another go, that sort of thing. Uh, the self-study materials would explain all of the uh, sort of um, the rules for, for, for taking those. Okay. I think we've we've covered that, have we? Yes, we have. I, I think uh, that's about it. Probably, you know, I can go back to this one slide just to recap what you all mentioned so that it's clear to them. Yeah. So essentially, this is what it is, right? Everything that Andrew has mentioned about the TOGAF uh, Business Architecture Foundation EA foundation and EA practitioner, and then the, the specialist, uh, which is which the prerequisite is again uh, foundation, either nine or uh, enterprise architecture foundation. Uh, these are the specialist batches. So that's all about the learning parts for the TOGAF standard 10th edition. Yeah, and if you go to the Open Groups website, if you click along to certifications and go to our uh, TOGAF certification portfolio, which is on one of the drop downs, there is this, this, these two, these slides appear. 
um, on the on the right there. And in fact, there's a link you can download if you if you if you want to just download. A, I think there's three slides that give you the sort of key overview. You can download those. So it might be a useful reference for some people. Okay. So I believe. Uh, um... I guess with that, we uh, this is all about the learning parts. What we can do is, Andrew, we can pass it on to the Nozom because they would like to cover something else. So I okay. we're going to gonna cover something slightly different and then we're going to come back to Q&A right at the very end, aren't we? Yes, we are. Yeah, OK. OK, thank you so much, Andrew and Karuna, for, uh, for your knowledge and expertise. Your insights have been very, very valuable. And now uh, I'll be introducing Ahmed Imam, my colleague at Nozum, and uh, he will be talk briefly talk about uh, the NORA framework and how it impacted a lot of organizations through the GCC. Okay, I, I'll, be, I'll be handing the mic to Ahmed right now. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Ahmed Imam. Uh, I'm a senior consultant. Uh, I'll just go over a brief description of the NORA methodology or the national overall reference architecture developed here in Saudi Arabia. So basically, the NORA methodology or framework is basically an output of the e-government program called YASIR. Okay, so the e-government program was developed in 2006 or around 2006 just to, uh, let's say, implement e-government programs or e-government systems. Uh, around Saudi Arabia. Okay, it was just to speed up the processes or, and services for the uh, governments. So basically, the YESA program or the e government program was basically done uh, as an audit process for the, all the government agencies in terms of uh, checking the other digital services they have and the automated processes they have and so on. It was, uh, let's say, a criteria was done in terms of uh, analyzing the current state or the maturity in terms of digital transformation uh, of any government agency. So after developing this criteria, they decided or they developed uh, the criteria into including the EA function or the EA capability inside the government agency itself. So basically it was all, uh, uh, it was all about uh, establishing the EA capability in terms of the maturity uh, applying which the, the EA team itself or the EA function and its integration in terms of the government agency inside and with other departments. So uh, after including this in their criteria, they then developed the NORA framework or the NORA methodologies just as a tool for all the government agencies to follow in terms of uh, establishing their own EA capability or their own tailored EA capability. So as we know, uh, the NORA methodology follows a 10-stage uh, life cycle in terms of, uh, let's say, developing the EA capability first and then analyzing the as-is and the to-be, uh, or like the current state and the target state for each organization. So that was a brief introduction. And now uh, I'll just uh, go over the goals and the features of the uh, NORA methodology. The goals, uh, basically, it, it's focused on uh, establishing the EA function or developing the EA function or the EA capability, which would then mean a smooth transi transition into the EA implementation. It was also made, uh, or like uh, it had the goal of the, defining the scope and requirements to help government agencies uh, reach their digital transformation strategies. And finally, uh, fac facilitating the EA utilization and the capability building. Now, the main features, in my opinion, uh, in the NORA methodology was they provided detailed examples and studies for government agencies to, to follow in terms of developing their own uh, tailored EA function. It was also basically written by government agencies to guide other government agencies, which, uh, let's say, had a uh, smoother impact on developing the EA function. And it's basically the last thing in their features. It's very, very, very customizable in terms of choosing what to do and what not to do, what uh, artifacts to develop, what artifacts not to develop, and so on. So yeah, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity uh, for letting me explain the NORA methodology. Uh, I'll take the, I'll give the mic back to uh, Shehab to continue on the uh, webinar.
Okay, thank you so much, Ahmed, for uh, the brief uh, explanation for Nora. And now we can um, we can start our Q and A session. Uh, back to you, Karuna. Thank you, Shahab. Thank you so much on that. Uh, thank you, Ahmed, as well for briefing us about Nora. Um, so we have quite a few questions. Some of them have been answered. Um, let's look at one. Andrew, uh, you no, know, there's one question on uh, for taking exam. Is it mandatory to train from the open group or indiv individual preparation? Is it fine? I'll let you take that. OK, well, actually, it depends is the answer. <laughs> In most cases, you can self study. So, um, for example, if you want to take the certifications, you could attend an accredited training course. Or if you want to self study, there are a couple of different ways you can do that. Obviously, you could just go to our publications library. You could locate the syllabus. It's, um, it's under a certifications tab, something called conformance requirements. And you could just decide to look, you know, based on the syllabus, you could look at the appropriate sections of the standard that it references. Or in, in our shop, we have um, some study guides. So there's a TOGAF Enterprise Architecture Study Guide. Obviously, there's a full study pack for TOGAF 9. Uh, we're still developing some of this material, so we don't have everything quite yet ready for the 10th edition. We have a TOGAF Business Architecture Foundation uh, study guide. So there are two study guides currently available for the 10th edition. We have obviously we have pocket guides as well. Uh, we also have something new for the 10th edition, and that's what we call online self-study. So you can actually go to the open group shop and you can buy access to um, self-study materials, which basically you go into a learning management system and you can basically look through the you know, the set of slides that will cover the syllabus and you can read the slides and the notes and study that way. We have practice tests available. Uh, again, you can buy those from our shop. I think they start at um, somewhere around ten dollars and um, you can either get the PDF or also we're offering uh, online access to um, to practice tests as well. So some people like to practice in a, in a computer based system, which is similar to like to doing the real exam. Other people you know, prefer to do it on paper. We, we provide both. So so the uh, the answer was <laughs> was you can do it either way. You can either um, decide to um, to take a, an accredited course or you can um, you can self study. There's no requirement to attend a course. OK, there may be some specific requirements, like there are some of the new migrations and some of the specialisms that are available that currently the only place that you can take those is with the open group uh, self-study. Uh, now, it may be that some of our accredited trainers will offer some of those over time uh, and some of them they won't. For example, we have a what we call the migration from business architecture level one, which was a 9.2 based certification credential. We're actually introducing a, a, a migration path for that uh, so that you can go from that. So if you've done your, um, you've already spent your time and you passed your exam for the business architecture level one, you can actually update that to business architecture foundation. And there's basically four modules you need to take and then an online assessment. That's only going to be available from the open group. So, you know, could, what we want to do over time with that is we want to phase out the business architecture level one and just have just business architecture foundation. So obviously we want to offer a path for the people who've put in all of that effort to you know, to do the business architecture level one. But we do want to stop um, business architecture level one at some point and, and just have the foundation. I'm not quite sure when that will be. Obviously, that's something we've got to discuss with our trainers because there are accredited trainers offering that course. So we don't we don't tend to do anything quickly. You know, we will always give a good amount of notice before we make any changes to the program. Uh, to add to that, uh, as Andrew has mentioned, um, we ourselves do not do training. The training is primarily done by accredited training course providers. You will be able to see the list of them on our website. What we do get is you do, you can get uh, the self-study material from our uh, shop, as Andrew has mentioned. Yeah. Uh, so that's one. The other question is, uh, does uh, Agile Enterprise Architecture covered in the TOGAF version, standard 10th edition? Well, the agility that we cover in the TOGAF standard 10th edition is sort of in two different ways. Um, so we've got, you know, how to apply EA with agility and also how to apply the sort of ADM with agile sprints. We also have a complementary standard that we call the open agile architecture standard that takes it sort of it's almost like a. It's a tangential view of EA looking at it from a different approach, looking at it from a very much an agile approach. Um, so, you know, 
So there are very much two sort of complementary views that you can look at agility with. There's either, you know, applying the TOGA standard with agility and applying the TOGA standard in the agile environments, or there's actually, you know, applying EA completely sort of with, with agile methods and things. So you need to probably look at both standards and then decide which way you want you want to go. Um, they're both very complementary and build upon each other and they're getting closer together. We've also published recently what we call a, an Agile EA playbook. So if you want to look at that, it's not a TOGAF series guide. It's very much more practical, uh, again, practical, practical oriented. So um, that's something that was a recent publication. We called it a playbook because we wanted to make it less formal, you know, sort of like these are experiences and you know, not necessarily best practice, but these are experiences that our members wanted to share. So um, that's where that's where you can find out about agility. We've got lots, lots of uh, information around there, lots of complementary material, both standards, the uh, TOGAF standard and also the open agile architecture standard are both developed by the same uh, of what we call forum. So that's the special interest group sort of within the open group. They develop uh, they develop those two standards. Uh, this question probably will answer and I'll ask you to add to it. So the question is, what does it take to get to get standard 10th edition who has done 9.2 certification? Um, as you would have seen Andrew's presentation, there's a bridge course available, which you can take up to get your TOGAF's 10th certification, right? Um, Andrew, would you like to add anything more to this? Uh, maybe, maybe in terms of how long it takes and how yeah, what, what we've done with the bridge is obviously to focus on, if you look at the syllabus, uh, we've tried not to sort of replicate things that you've already learnt with your TOGAF 9 certification. So it'll, it'll start off by looking at, you know, what has changed, because obviously that's important to know. If, if you're coming from 9 to, to the 10th edition, it's important to know, you know, what the differences are. So we cover that. But then very much it's um, focused on, and as the name suggests, on being an enterprise architect. So this is going around the ADM cycle, you know, basically the task that you would do to create and sustain an EA and you know, an enterprise architecture. So that's that's the focus. And um, as I mentioned, there is a shorter exam. So that's the other thing is you get you obviously you get your you study the differences. Obviously, you would also still do the practical exercises if you're attending a training course. Um, but you do get to take a shorter exam as part of the recognition for the learning that you've already sort of invested in, in the TOGAF standard. So it's a 60 minute exam rather than having to take two exams, which if you were going the other way, the other way you would have to take a 60 minute part one plus a 90 minute part two for the bridge. It's just a 60 minute. There's no idea of a part one and part two with the bridge. It's just it's a single exam. It's actually got two different sorts of questions, but that's it actually comes as a single exam and you have to pass it all. There's no sort of like, oh, I got half of it. Can I take the other half? That that doesn't that concept doesn't exist with the bridge exam. So the question is for the bridge, is there a specific guide as part of the TOGA standard 10 for somebody to take a bridge? Are there specific guides? Well, again, you what you would do, um, there isn't a specific well, you can again, you can go and look at the conformance requirements. It's basically the same body of knowledge as the you know, the full practitioner obviously just goes into a slightly different level and obviously goes into the differences and things like that. Um, you would need to look at um, the conformance requirements. They will actually tell you which documents. If you imagine it's the six fundamental content, it's uh, and then it's slices of another six documents. I can't remember them all and we didn't show you the slide, but so we do have a slide. Um, that sort of summarizes I that. I can bring yeah. it up if you want me to. If we've got time just to show the slide because it would be it would be useful. This is for the bridge, right? Uh, probably the enterprise architecture body of knowledge which is the one with the circles. Okay. We've got 12 circles. Right. This one? That looks like the one. Yeah. Yeah. So if um basically if you were studying either to become enterprise architecture practitioner or you know coming via the bridge you basically got to cover the same body of knowledge the syllabus is slightly different as i mentioned there is some more differences but these are the actual 12 documents from which we draw the syllabus for for, for becoming you know for being an enterprise architect now the scissors 
those are important because it is only certain bits of these documents that we draw the learning outcomes from. So if you looked at this, it says, oh, look, it's got the leader's guide in there. That doesn't mean you need to know all of the leader's guide. It's just a specific section of it. I think I think it might be about governance or something. So, you know, that's where you would um, you would be expected to know. that. So if you were to go down and find the detailed syllabus or pick up one of the study guides, it actually explains what you do need to know. And it's sort of like it has a, you know, it says, oh, I'm learning about architecture content, say, and it will say, all oh, right, well, that's from the architecture content volume I have to know. You know, there's a specific chapter that covers the deliverables. And so that's the sort of slice that you will get. So so that's what you're covered. You're basically going to cover the same set of documents. So if you look at this, you know, there's nothing really about business architecture in there. But if you looked at the business architecture body of knowledge, you would suddenly see six or seven guides that were business arch architecture specific. So it's the idea of identifying among the 28 documents that are the standard which are the relevant documents for a specific skill set and the scissors are actually just cutting that down to you know really what is relevant for that skill set for that competency i hope that helped there's one other question uh, let's check uh, is exam style going to be subjective or objective uh, these are again objective questionnaires uh, about i don't know how many but i'll let uh, andrew mention that uh, yeah, obviously we have to ask the questions in a way that, you know, we can justify the answers. So, yes, I'm, I'm not quite sure what is meant by objective versus subjective. I would think they're all very objective. Obviously, we have... Um, it's like multiple choice questions. Yes, or is for, for the simple... Yeah. Um, for part one exams, we, we, we use what we call simple, simple multiple choice questions. There's obviously a question and then there are four possible answers and you have to pick the right answer or the best answer sometimes it may say what is the best answer sometimes there's a you know you're asked for a bit of judgment about you know there might be you know something which has got the most complete answer and so you would have to select that one when it says it's the best answer now for these exams for the part one you're looking at a 60 percent pass mark so that's typically well it is not just typically it is 24 out of 40 it doesn't change 60 percent is 60 percent um for part for the bridge, which was a specific question, we actually have a, a mix of questions. So if I remember, and this is, you know, you can go to our website and check this, but I believe you take 10 multiple choice, so one point each, and then you will take four what we call um, complex scenario questions, which can score a maximum of five points each. And the idea is for the bridge, you need to score at least 18 out of 30 which I believe is also 60%. Again, my math is... Um, is 60%, yeah. Yes, so, and then if you're taking the part two exam, that is just eight what we call complex scenario questions. Now, what I mean by scenario question is that um, there's a story, you read the story, I'm working as a so-and-so architect at a type, certain type of company, Da, 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 da. the situation is this da, 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 da. we've got a, and then eventually the question will be sort of what did you do next based on the concerns raised by the ceo or something and then there'll be four paragraphs uh, four possible answers each of them usually you know one or two sentences so you know it's not just a single simple uh, sentence it's usually uh, putting together a couple of sentences making a case for something and you have to pick the best answer now three of the answers are actually correct but they're different what we call graded gradient scored so they didn't you know one is the best answer uh, that's the most correct and that would score score five points another one is the second best so it's usually something you know maybe something missing from that or something wrong and so you get three points and then there's something that's even 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 less sort of correct so the third best and that's one point and then there's one that is just wrong and that scores zero points so you have to make your choice reading the story and the situation what you're being asked you know, to pick the right, um, to pick the best answers. Um, for the part two, again, you've got to score at least 24 out of 40. So again, you've got to get 60%. So for the part one and the part two and the bridge, the pass mark is 60%. And obviously there are different numbers of questions and different amounts of time. Uh, if you um, live in a country where English is sort of the second language, so English isn't your first language, and you register to take an exam um, 
at a test center, then you can, uh, I mean, if you register to take one of the exams, actually it is at a test center or remotely, you can have what we call an easel time extension. So English as a second language, easel, ESL. Uh, that's automatically added. So when you book, if, if you're on our list, we have a list of countries where we automatically grant time extensions. Um, what you would be getting for a part one exam, you would be getting 30 minutes extra. And it's the same for a part two exam. You get um, 30 minutes extra. If you're taking a combined exam, there is actually a special version of the exam with the timed extension on it. So you've got to look for that, that version of the exam. It's usually got dash easel in the name. Anyway, I've probably spent too long on this answer, so I better stop before we run out of time. Yeah, we'll take two last questions here, Andrew. One is uh, for um, the 10 bridge, is it available in French? Yes, okay. O-G-E-A-F-10-B is the, what you'll notice, the exams have got various codes. OGEA are the new enterprise architecture ones. They, there's like 101, 102, 103 for the English, um, part one, part two, and, and combined, and then NB for the bridge. And then if it's got an F at the start of it, so F101, F102, F10B, that will be French, and there is a French bridge one, and we got Chinese ones coming as well soon. Okay, there you go. So we'll take one last question. You probably will answer it. It says, what is the pass mark and total marks for the online exam for foundation? As Andrew has mentioned, it's 60%, uh, 40 questions, so 24 is the pass mark. Do we have a mock exam site to try scenario based questions? Yes, we do. You can go to, um, as I say, you can go to the shop and you can buy um, one of our practice tests. The practice test gives you a PDF as well as access. It gives you the access codes, the enrollment key. So you can go into the open groups learning management system. You can find the practice thing and it says, oh, right, enter the enrollment key. You put in the magic key and you can practice on there for 60 days. Yes. Uh, probably I'll take one last question, okay, before we wrap it up. Uh, is is it the pass mark same 60% for EA practitioner as well? I suppose the answer is yes. Yes, the part one, the part two, and the bridge are all 60%. Yep. Right. Uh, uh, what we'll do is, uh, as part of the uh, uh, proceedings, we'll be sharing you a list of FAQs as well and access to our website where you'll be able to uh, get answers to all the questions that you've asked so far and additional information in terms of where you can get our self-study material and also access to who are our accredited training course providers for the uh, new certification as well. Right. Uh, with that, we'll wrap it up and I'll pass it on to Shahab. Shahab, over to you. Thank you so much, Andrew and Corinna, for, uh, for like answering all the questions. It's been very beneficial for everybody. And like, thank you all for joining us today for our live event webinar for the TOGAF 10th edition. Uh, talking about the certification portfolio and learning path. We hope you found this session informative, insightful, and, and that you have gained a better understanding of the TOGAF 10th edition certification portfolio and learning path. We would like to extend our gratitude to our expert speakers, Andrew and Karuna, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and expertise with, with everybody. And we'll also uh, mention my colleague Ahmed Amin for providing a brief introduction about Nora. And uh, once again, thank you so much for attending today's webinar, and we wish you all the best in your TOGAF 10 certification journey. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank, well, you. thank you, Andrew. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. thank you. thank you, everybody. Bye.